It really is good to see all of you here today, and I just pray God's going to continue to bless us and just help us experience everything he has for us. We're going to just now look into the Bible, and we're going to learn a little bit more about the book of Revelation. For the last several weeks, we have been studying from the book of Revelation. Today, we are going to uh, be in Revelation chapter 5, and we're going to start with verse number 6. We're going to read, first of all, part of verse 6 and then verse number 7. Remember, the book of Revelation was exactly that. It was a revelation, a revealing, an uncovering of Jesus Christ. It's not a revelation of the Antichrist. It's not a revelation of the tribulation period. It's not a revelation of all kinds of other things. Even though those things are mentioned, the primary focus of the book is it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals Jesus to the world in the way that he's going to fulfill his role in the unfolding of human history. So it's all about Jesus. Let me tell you something. The major theme of the Bible is Jesus. We must never forget that. And so we're studying the revelation of Jesus Christ. God gave the revelation to Jesus. Jesus gave it to an angel. The angel gave it to John. John wrote it down, chose seven messengers, and sent it out to seven churches in Asia. And it's been preserved for us today. We learned in chapters 2 and 3 that in this revelation, um, there is material that is good for those seven churches that were in Asia, but this material is good for all of the churches throughout the church age. There's just some good life-changing stuff in this revelation of Jesus. So let's go to chapter 5, start with verse number 6. John wrote, Then I saw a lamb. Who is the lamb all through Scripture? Jesus. So he said, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. There's our crucified Jesus. Standing at the center of the throne. Right there in the throne in heaven with his father is Jesus. And then he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So today we're going to be talking about the lamb and the seven-sealed scroll. The Lamb takes the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Let's pray. Father, help us to look into your word today and be serious students of your word. Lord, I pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher because we confess that we're powerless to understand anything from your word without the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. You have said that the things of God are spiritually discerned. And Father, if we don't have the Holy Spirit living in us, then they're foolishness to us and we can't understand them. And so, Father, I pray that, that you'll be our teacher today. I pray that you'll show us exactly what you want us to know. I pray that you'll do spiritual warfare for us, Lord, and, and just surround us with your presence and drive out any evil influences that might try to distract us or hinder our, our concentration on your word today, Lord. We want to hear from heaven. We want to hear from you through your word. I pray that in Jesus' name and for his sake. And amen. So Revelation chapter 5 is John's record of another vision that he received from Jesus. It included the lamb and the seven-sealed scroll. The vision begins with the scene of Panic among the angelic community in heaven. John described the scene when he wrote this. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That's Jesus, the king of heaven, and all of his, in all of his majestic and, and majesty and power as he is portrayed in chapter 4. If you went back and read chapter 4, Jesus is on the throne as the king, the Christ, the king of all kings, and the Lord of all lords. And so he is pictured on this throne in his role and in his character as, as the one who has all authority. And then... Standing in the center of the throne, we see Jesus pictured in another way. He is portrayed as a lamb. You see, not only is he the king with all of the authority of a king to rule over his kingdom, but this is also, this character that we call Jesus, is also the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A sacrifice for us so that our sin debt could be paid forever. And so he says, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll 
with writing on both sides. In 96 AD, when the Revelation was written, scrolls were normally written on only one side. This scroll contained so much vital information that it took both sides of the parchment to record it all. So you see, there's a lot of stuff in history, and a lot of that history is still future to us. In the unfolding of God's plan for the human race, there's a lot of stuff that we need to know. There's a lot of stuff that the world needs to know. And so this scroll is written both on the front and on the back. It is God's record of the role that the Lamb will play in the unfolding of human history, written in advance from 96 AD going forward. I want to tell you something. Only God... Only the God of the Bible can write history in advance. Are you aware of that? And we know that he wrote history in advance because all through the Old Testament, he told us in the form of prophecy what that advance history was going to be and what it was going to be like. And every word that he ever said about the unfolding drama of human history has come about exactly as he said it would because he wrote the narrative. He already knows what history holds, and so he can tell us about it ahead of time. And that's what he does here in this chapter. He tells us the role that Jesus is going to play as the Lamb of God, as this conquering king in the unfolding drama of human history. And then it says that this, uh, this scroll was sealed with seven seals. First century lo Roman law required that important legal documents like a person's last will and testament be sealed with seven seals. The scrolls containing these documents were tied with seven strings and each string was sealed with wax at the knots to prevent them from being opened prematurely or by anyone not authorized to open the document. This kind of legal document, not just anybody had the privilege to open it up and read it. Only authorized people could do that. And so they searched throughout all of heaven looking for someone who is, who is legally qualified to open this scroll and they can't find anybody and panic breaks out in the angelic community and they're wailing and weeping because nobody is found worthy to open the scroll and then finally one of those seven angelic or one of those four angelic creatures surrounding the throne of God cries out and says to John don't weep anymore the Lamb of God has prevailed to open the scroll he's worthy he has the authority he has been commissioned by his father to break the seals of the scroll and reveal to us the role he's going to play in the unfolding drama of human history. John wrote in, in Revelation 5, verses 2 to 4, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, or excuse me, chapter 6, I saw, or excuse, chapter 5 is right, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. Who has the legal authority to break these seals and open this scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And then I, that's John, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy. No one with the legal authority to open the scroll or to look inside. And then suddenly, the angelic panic in John's grief was ended by an announcement from one of the 24 elders. Remember, there were 24 elders seated around 24 smaller thrones, around the throne there in heaven. And we talked about the fact that maybe these, and we can only say maybe because he doesn't tell us for sure, maybe they represented the 12 patriarchs of the tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and maybe the 12 apostles of the church in the New Testament. We really don't know, but they have special positions of rulership around the throne of God, whoever they are. And then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's an ancient Old Testament title for the long-awaited Messiah of the Jews, the one we call Jesus. You can see that in Genesis 49, 9 and 10, Isaiah 31, 4, Hosea 11 and 10. The lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the one. In the New Testament, he's Jesus, the Lamb of God. In the Old Testament, he was the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. That's another ancient Hebrew title for the Messiah taken 
from um, the scriptures and then repeated, uh, taken from the Old Testament scriptures and then repeated in Revelation twenty two sixteen says that, that, that this one, this one who was the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David, an ancestor of King David, it says he has triumphed. He has won. Do you know what the word tri triumph means? It means to win in a battle. It means that you're victorious. It means that the enemy is defeated. And I want you to see what this says about Jesus. Not he will triumph, but what? He has triumphed, meaning that the battle's already won. Jesus has already won the battle. Do you get that? That the devil is already defeated. That every enemy he ever has is already defeated. So if we let the devil cause us to live defeated lives, we're doing something that is totally unnecessary because he's already defeated. Jesus has triumphed. You get that? We need to understand who this Jesus is. And then it says that he has triumphed. He is able to open the scrolls and its seven seals and as we'll see in next week's lesson every time jesus opens one of the seals on the scroll he is revealed as one who is in control of the events on planet earth as human history unfolds jesus is in complete control i got news for you he's still on the throne when he went back to heaven he was seated at the right hand of the Father, right there in the throne with him, and he has never abdicated the throne. He is still on the throne. It doesn't matter what happens on planet Earth. Jesus is still in complete control, and he unfolds all of human history exactly according to the plan that he has for it to culminate in his second coming and in his establishing his kingdom and then his people having the opportunity to reign with him forever and ever and ever and ever. He is right on schedule in human history. And listen, when you, when you bring that down to a personal level, he's right on schedule in your life. You say, oh, some terrible things have happened to me. Jesus must not love me. Those terrible things happen to you because Jesus does love you. And he's working those things out in order to get you to the position where you'll finally look up and see who he is and how much he really loves you and that he is the one who is in complete control of your life. When you do what he wants you to do, he'll bless you. When you don't do what he wants you to do, he'll judge you, he'll discipline you, not because he's angry at you, but because he loves you and he wants to change your behavior to make you the man or the woman that he wants you to be he's still on the throne he's still in control I love that after all the book of Revelation is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ that's especially important when we look at this next week because next week when when these seven seals are opened actually six of them um, these different horsemen come riding out, and I hear people interpret the book of Revelation all the time as if those horsemen are the Antichrist. It's not the revelation of the Antichrist. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that next week. So let's talk about this lamb who was slain. The next scene of John's vision shifts from Jesus as the supreme authority over human history because of his pedigree he's the lion of the tribe of judah he was descended from the right tribe the ruling tribe of the nation of israel and his genealogy the root of david so it shifts from him having the right pedigree to be one who is an authority like a king like a christ it shifts to jesus as the one who is worthy to have supreme authority over human history because he earned it by dying to rescue the human race from the eternal consequences of sin. There's a shift between his human pedigree and the sacrifice he made as the Lamb of God. He said this, Then I saw a lamb. First he saw one sitting on the throne with all kinds of majestic and, and kingly authority, supreme authority, and he's holding a seal. And now this, it shifts to him seeing not jesus as the supreme authority and king but now jesus as the lamb then i saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain that's a clear reference 
to the crucifixion of Jesus. He's standing at the center of the throne, the most prominent place in the entire scene, right in the middle of the throne. There stands the Lamb of God that John said would take away the sins of the world. That's in Revelation 5, 6, the first part of the verse. This is, this is that lamb that John the Baptist pointed out to his disciples in John chapter 1, verse number 29. It said the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, in our world today, people have all kinds of uh, suggested antidotes for sin. All kinds of ways that people think you can deal with your sin and, and by dealing with your sin in a variety of different ways, you might be able to make it to heaven. And some of them in the religious world even say that all roads lead to heaven. I got news for you. There's only one road, only one footpath that leads to heaven. And his name is Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so here he is pictured in the center of the throne because of the sacrifice that he has made. And he is encircled by four living creatures and the elders. And that's what it says, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. This is the lamb that John saw. This is the lamb that John the Baptist said was the one who would take away the sins of the world. And then John wrote this as we go further through this verse in, in, uh, in the Revelation, the, the second part of verse 6 of chapter 5. He wrote, the lamb had seven horns. The ancient Jews viewed horns like those of a ram to be an indication of strength or power. And, and you say, well, there are seven horns. Well, in the study of Bible numerics, the number seven refers to the whole or the total of anything. So John's description of the lamb means having seven heads, and, I mean having seven horns, means that he possessed the complete strength or power, the, the complete ability to determine the course of human history. Jesus has the ability to turn the course of human history wherever he wants it to go. He has the power to do that. Not only does he have the authority to do it, but because he died, he earned the power to do that. So he is pictured here as as a lamb with seven horns, the total or complete power to do anything that he wants to do. And then it says he has seven eyes. You see, this lamb sees everything, past, present, and future. He has seven eyes. Again, that number seven in the study of Bible numerics indicates that, that it's the total or the whole of anything. Eyes are the members of the body by which you see everything. So Jesus has the power to see everything. He knows it all. He has already seen it all, past, present, and future. You see, sometimes we're surprised by what we do in life. You say, I never thought I would do that. Jesus knew you would do it. You say, I, I, I never believed that I would be in this situation. Jesus knew you would be there. You say, I never thought that somebody would do that to me. Jesus knew they would do it to you because he is the one that had the seven eyes. He's the one that sees everything, past, present, and future. And because of that, he can supply all of the grace you need at any moment to go through any circumstance that you're ever going to go through. And his grace is sufficient because he knows exactly what you need. He already knew you were going to be there before you ever go. Got there. Isn't that incredible? What a Jesus. What a Jesus this is. Referring to Jesus, John wrote this in his gospel, the same author. He wrote the Revelation. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote this. He is sent by God. God's words. For God gives him the Spirit without limit. And that ties in very well with the last part of this sixth verse. It says that he has these seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Again, the number uh, seven in the study of Bible numerics would mean the total or the complete of anything. And, and so this means that the lamb possessed the full power and insight of the Holy Spirit. Those seven lamps burning before the throne, or those seven eyes, the seven lamps were in the last week's lesson, but the seven eyes of, of the lamb represent the fact that he has all 
ability to see everything that's ever going to happen because he has the full empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because it says that those seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the lamb possessed the full power, the full sight, the full ability to know everything that was going on because he had the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's what John said. He is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him his spirit without limit. Without limit. Wow. And then the next scene in John's vision reveals a stark transition in the way heaven is viewed by Jesus, at the, or the way heaven viewed Jesus at this point. How does heaven look at Jesus at this point? Because there's, there's a transition. Transition. No longer is he just the powerful king. Now he's the sacrificial lamb. Heaven no longer focused on his supreme authority because of his genealogy, but now they focus on his supreme authority because he's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is what John wrote when you get down into verses 7 and 8. He wrote this. He, that's Jesus as this sacrificial lamb, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. You see, Jesus, as the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David, he had the authority, he had the power, he had the ability to just take the scroll because he's the one that's worthy to open it. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. That's a posture of submission and worship when you fall down before somebody. You're recognizing them as supreme. You're rec recognizing them as worthy of worship. And so the 24 elders and those four living creatures, they fall down in a, in a position of worship. Each one had a harp. That was a common mu musical instrument used in the Old Testament for worship. When you read back through the Old Testament, often they played the harp as an, as an expression of worship. And so worship is breaking out in heaven because of the Lamb of God who has taken this scroll. A grand worship service is about to break out in heaven. It said, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Often in the Old Testament, when they burned incense, it was, a, it was an expression of worship, and it represented the prayers of God's people, and that's what it represents here. My friend, praying is an expression of worship. Praying is, an, is a method by which we convey from our heart to the ears of God his great value, his great worth, his holiness, his power, his majesty, and everything else that we could ever think of to say about him. It's an expression of worship. And it says the four living creatures and the 24 elders are at this point worshiping the Lamb. They're praying and they're praying to him. However, it's a new kind of worship, a different than the worship in, in the vision that we looked at in chapter 4. The, the vision in chapter 4, the 24 elders worship the one who sits on the throne because of the power he displayed in the creation of the universe. You see, up until Jesus came as the Lamb of God, the biggest thing that God had ever done was created everything. But now Jesus has come as the Lamb of God. And God has done something even bigger, even more magnificent, even more mind-boggling than, than God creating all of the universes that dance throughout the heavens. And that is that God became human, and we call him Jesus. And God lived a sinless life, and God died a voluntary death on a Roman rack of execution that we call a cross so that God could take care of the sins of the whole human race and give us the incredible gift of eternal life. That's bigger than creation. And so the shift in heaven from the worship of, the, of this one on the throne because he's the creator to the worship of the one on the throne because he's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John wrote it like this in, in, in Revelation 4.10. We can see what, what the theme of the worship was. It said the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. And look, look why they're worshiping him in chapter 4. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Nothing wrong with worshiping Jesus because he's the creator. But something's far higher is when you worship Jesus because he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, this creation is only temporary, but the eternal life 
that God offers to those who believe in him is not temporary, it's eternal, it's forever. So the, the vision in chapter 5, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they worship the lamb because he died to rescue mankind from the horrible consequences of sin. John wrote about it like this in, in, in verses 9 and 10 of Revelation 6. He says, and they sang a new song. What kind of song? A new song. You see, there's a change here in heaven. There's a new song in heaven. I get amazed at people sometimes in churches. They'll say, well, I don't like all this new music. I like those old songs. And you know what they're talking about, right? They're talking about the 1930s and 30s, 1930 and 1940 style songs that they grew up with. And listen, I like those too. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with a new song. There's going to be a new song in heaven. A new song. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. <laughs> You're worthy to determine the course of human history. That's what they're saying. Because you were slain. So now why in, in this vision, why are they worshiping the Lamb? Because He died. Because you were slain. He was crucified. He's the crucified Christ. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Don't you love that? A global movement was started from a hill in the nation of Israel outside the walls of the ancient city of Jerusalem when Jesus, the Lamb of God, died there. And that movement has spread all around the globe. And here we are on the opposite side of the planet thousands of years later, worshiping Him because He is the Lamb who died, the crucified Christ. And with your blood... With your blood you did that. You purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. That's a reference to the thousand year reign of Christ right here on the earth when faithful believers will reign with him. John referred to this thousand year reign of Christ on the earth when he wrote about deceased believers in Revelation 20 and verse number 4. He wrote, they came to life. This is the resurrection of the unbelievers, if you read the context there. He said, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. He's going to reign with Christ right here, on, or we are right here on planet Earth. That's Revelation 20 and verse number 4. Next, all the angels of heaven... Join in this joyous worship service, the theme of which is the sacrificial death of the Lamb. John wrote it like this. I love this. He said, then I looked, and the 24 elders and the, and the four living creatures, the four angelic creatures around the throne, they're already worshiping because he's the Lamb that had been slain. And now all of the angels join in. Then I looked and heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, multiple thousands, and they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. So it, it seems like uh, as, as the noise of the worship of the 24 elders and the four living creatures, as that echoes throughout heaven, it draws a crowd. You know what's supposed to happen when we worship the way we're supposed to worship? It's supposed to draw a crowd. It drew a crowd. All these, all these people, they, they, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And, and in a loud voice, they were saying, oh, these are all the angels of heaven. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. You see, the, the, the focus is still on the fact that he died. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. The focus is of this worship extravaganza is worthy is the lamb who was slain. You get that? Most of the world doesn't understand that. Most of the world views the death of Jesus the way Christians portray it as a terrible tragedy. Some unbelievers who are still in the darkness and the devil is clouding their minds say, you know, if your God is so powerful and if he's the God you say he is, then it's a sheer tragedy that he let his son die the way he died. That's pure human reasoning. God not only allowed it, 
God engineered it. And he did it because he loves the whole human race. And you know, it really wasn't a tragedy for Jesus to die. You know why? Because God knew he was going to raise him from the dead. For Jesus, death was only temporary. He was going to raise him from the dead. And because of that, God is not only the father of Jesus, but he's the father of what he said he wanted in the book of Hebrews, many brothers and sisters. What an incredible, incredible God that we have. And then, as the worship service comes to a conclusion, the four living creatures said, Amen. Which means, so be it. Let it be so. What are they saying so be it about? What they have just cried out in their worship, that this, this lamb that has been sacrificed for them he is, he is worthy of praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. He is worthy of that. Every, that, that happens, and, and, and that happens as this scene begins to unfold. The, the, the worship celebration is not only joined by the angels, um, we saw that up in chapter 5, but, but the celebration is also joined by every creature in the universe human beings still on planet earth human beings already in heaven every creature in the universe john wrote this this is in verse 13 of revelation 5 then i heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne that's jesus portrayed as the creator in the old testament and to the lamb, that's Jesus portrayed as the sacrificial lamb in the New Testament, to him be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. We start with the four elders. It expanded, I mean, with the four living creatures. It expanded to the 24 elders. It expanded to every angel, multiplied thousands of angels in heaven. And then the worship service is expanded to include every creature in God's universe and they end the service as the four living creatures said amen let it be so let him get the praise and the honor and the glory that he deserves and the elders fell down and worshiped taking a position of submission they expressed from their hearts to the lamb his eternal value to them and my friend that's what we ought to do on a daily basis so here's the conclusion if you want to be among those who have the spectacular opportunity to participate in this grand worship celebration that John described in the fifth chapter of Revelation as God reveals who Jesus really is and the roles that he'll play in the unfolding of human history you must be among those to whom John was referring when he said you are worthy because you have purchased for God persons from among every tribe and language and people and nation. You've got to be among those who have been purchased. You've got to be among those that, that Jesus has bought out of the slave market of sin by paying the price of death on the cross. You've got to be among those who believe that he did that for you and then called on him to receive the benefit of the purchase that he made when he died on the cross for you. You believe that and you call out to him and you recognize that he's the master and you're the slave and your only hope of life, eternal life, is in him. And you call on him to receive it. And when you do that, he'll give you eternal life. He closes the transaction You've been a blood-bought son or daughter of God, and from this moment on, you're the slave and he's the master. He has complete authority over your life. He could ask you to do anything he wants you to do, and the only appropriate answer is, yes, Lord. And my friend, if you're among that group, you get to participate in this worship service. If you're not among that group, hell is waiting eagerly to receive you.